he is worthy of all our praise. You know, sometimes we come in different situations, different head spaces when we come to church in the morning. Some people are going through challenging times. Some people are very excited about what God's doing in their life and the life they're living right now. But in each circumstance of life, the word of God through King David gave us wisdom how to approach the circumstance we're experiencing. In Psalm 103, he said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. David's reminding himself that when we praise the Lord, it brings us through and gives us strength to move through the difficult time we're experiencing. He also goes on to discuss many benefits that are released to those people that bless the Lord, who praise the Lord. He goes on to say, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities. How many people are happy your iniquities are pardoned? How many people are happy you're forgiven from the mistakes you made in the past? Is there anybody in the house? How many people are really, really excited? He pardons all of our iniquities. That's good news this morning. He heals all your diseases. He sent his word and healed them. He says, who redeems your life from the pit. How many people made some mistakes in the past and wish you could forget them? Amen. He said he redeems them. He brought it back. That life that was useless in that situation is now productive and positive and life-giving to others in this situation. He redeems all of our lives. Who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like an eagle. When we bless the Lord, when we praise the Lord and give thanks to Him, there's an exchange and a resetting of our mind, a resetting of our emotions, a resetting of our position in the grace of God. So we're going to take a moment right now. We're going to say, you know, bless God in the morning. We bless God in the evening. That every chance I get, I'm going to bless your name. Sing this together. Bless God in the morning. Here we go. Bless God. I bless your name in the morning. I bless your name. I bless your name in the evening. I bless your name in the morning. Every chance I get. Your name in the morning, every chance I get. 
thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Father, we bless you this morning. Father, I thank you for each and every person who's in this place today, who's here to meet with you, Lord God, here to fellowship with the believers, Lord, but here to meet with you. I pray, God, your Holy Spirit would be released, your word would come alive, and faith would rise up in your people that we could be all that you've called us to be and bring you glory through our lives. We ask this together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Give somebody a high five and say, let's get right at it. Well, good morning again and welcome. My name is uh, Rick, lead pastor at All Nations. It's my privilege to work with a team of pastors and and elders and a great team of people that uh, do the work of All Nations Church here on Sundays and all week long. Can we give it up for our team that works so hard? We thank God so many people have contributed in so many ways to bring us to where we are today. Uh, My wife is Kathy over here. Kathy, could you wave at my friends? This is my wife, Kathy, those that don't know her. Uh, Elizabeth and Pastor Eric is my firstborn. I'm introducing people to my family because we have new people in the fall, and I'm just reintroducing who we are. And uh, Sarah and, uh, and Justin are in, in, um, in town, too, and I have a son, Nathan, and his wife, Jessica. And together, we have 11 grandchildren, and what a blessing that is, 11 grandchildren. My wife is going praising again in the front row. What a privilege it is to work here and serve you here at All Nations Church. Uh, God has been doing so many amazing things, so many great things. But when I think of today, I think of uh, when was the last time you asked for something really big from God? When was the last time you asked something really big from God? I remember in my past, you know, I've asked for things. We asked for the radio stations, a little youth pastor, never, never had a... Never knew what he was doing with radio, but he knew media was the way to go, so I had to start stepping towards it. We asked God to give us a radio license, and he gave us a radio license. It's like, hallelujah. People are saying, how did you get a radio license? And then Fort McMurray. You know, we, he gave us another radio license here in Fort McMurray, and it's just like, oh, Lord, how did that happen? God, you did that. And then the biggest jump of all, when you go from a low-power radio station to a high-power radio station... You usually have to go through five or six hundred thousand dollars worth of, of analysis and research and engaging of people for them to give you a high powered station. You don't do that without a reapplication and a reprocess. But we ask God, God, can you make a way for us? Can you give us a high powered radio station from a low powered radio station uncontested? And sure enough, God gives us the high powered radio station you hear right now is a 911 um, UCB 911. I met a girl. I didn't meet her. I'd like to meet her. She was an amazing woman. She wrote a book, Span of Control, and at Global Leadership Summit in Chicago in August, she shared a story of a young girl coming out of high school, and uh, she didn't really know what she wanted to do, so she went into a U.S. Navy Academy for two years. And she went into that Navy Academy for two years, and then she went on in her U.S. Navy training, and she became a pilot, and she began to uh, fly planes, and it was exciting. And of course, when you start doing something, you don't want to just, you're not happy with where you are, mediocre, the entry level. You want to go higher. You want to do something greater. Well, this lady had the ambition that she wanted to be, you know, a, a, a naval aviator. A, a, you know, she wanted to high, fly one of those big military jets that goes on wild missions. And when she came to the end of her training, the admiral invites her in and says, come on in here. I want to talk to you. She says, I know you've been doing pretty well in school. You've trained very well, very pleased with what you've done. But we got to let you know that um, there's no place for women in naval aviation in the U.S. Navy. You're going to have to pick one of two things. You're going to have to pick another job in the Navy or you're going to have to quit. You can imagine that young girl who's Experience the joy of flying, the, the work she put into becoming this aviator and this, uh, you know, pilot, this combat pilot. She said she went out of the room and she said, shortly thereafter, she came back in and she kind of went right up to the face of that admiral and says, you've got to find a third way. And the long story short is they did find a third way. And she became the first woman uh, naval aviator in, in uh, U.S. military history. She went against the status quo. She went against 
the confines of the system she worked within. And as she stepped out in faith and made a declaration and did everything she could to get where she wanted to be, she got where she wanted to be. And I want to challenge us today that when was the last time you asked for something really big from God? Amazing. If you're like me, you kind of go... um, Ask for something big, and then if it happens after a little while, you get discouraged. I got really discouraged after two and a half years listening to a terrible radio station. I heard every buzz. I heard everything. It's like, Lord, let me unplug this thing. It's terrible. People don't like it. It's terrible. He said, don't give up. He said, don't give up. Everything in me was given up, but I had a fear of the Lord that said, do not pull the plug. And we carried on, carried on. Sooner or later, God came through. You might be like me in this room today. And uh, you don't like the options that you've been given in your circumstances. Maybe you're believing for a big vision. Maybe you have a physical condition that you don't like the options that the doctor gave you. Maybe you're going through relationship challenges with your spouse or somebody like that. Maybe it's a work challenge and you don't have the options that you like. I want to challenge you today to think of what a new kind of prayer could be. What could a new possibility come from God be in your circumstances? Are you willing to learn what it takes to be able to pray that prayer and see the breakthrough and the victory that you want to see? That's what we're going to talk about today in this study going back into uh, the Full Send series. And we're looking at Elijah and Elisha and some of their stories. Last week, Pastor Eric reminded us that miracles and breakthroughs and abundant lives is our expectation For every person in this church, we expect miracles to happen. We we expect supernatural breakthroughs to happen. We expect, I know right now people are waiting for a financial breakthrough. We know people are waiting for the job they've been waiting for. So many things. I want to tell you today what we're believing with you. We're expecting with you that God is going to do something supernatural. And we can learn some things today from the prophet um, Elijah about how to get there. This message is called Your Next Big Thing. Let's pray again and ask God to help us give this message. Heavenly Father, we look to you today. We look to your word. We invite your Holy Spirit to empower it, that it would bring life and hope and encouragement and supernatural faith to your people, that we could uh, make those bold requests um, for our personal lives and also for the lives of your church, your people. We desire people to see you. Would you help me with this message today, Lord, and bless your people, I pray, in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Well, we're looking at that famous story today, uh, 1 Kings 18, and it's the story of the battle of Ahab and Elijah on Mount Carmel. How many people have heard about that story? It's a classic story. A lot of people love it and have listened to it. Now, it's 40 verses long, so I will not tell you the whole story. I'll give you a recap of it, and then I'll focus in on some of the scriptures that are are significant, if you don't mind. This is really a story about a man of the spirit and a man of the flesh. Ahab is a man of the flesh. He was he was uh, he was a king over Israel, and he was uh, called and anointed to to do this to lead this nation. But he became fleshly, and he pulled away from God. And as a result, the consequences were felt in the ministry that he led, or his nation that he led. And uh, and so Elijah, on the other hand, was a man just like Ahab and just like you and me. The Word of God tells us, and uh, but he was a man of the Spirit. He was a man that was walking after God's own heart, that put his mind and set his mind on the things of God. And when he did that, he began to see the reality of the kingdom of God manifesting in his life, even in the midst of these terrible consequences that everybody else was experiencing. So this is a man, this is a, a, between the, the flesh and the spirit, a spirit man uh, and a worldly man, okay? Ahab was backslidden. Uh, as I said, he... he he led his nation into adulterous worship and idolatry, and uh, that's why we see this great um, famine over the land. Um, we see that the story is set up that, of course, Egypt or Israel was in Egypt in bondage for many years. God supernaturally came and brought them out, brought them into the wilderness for 40 years where he fed them supernaturally every day. He gave them the things they needed every day. He protected them from the scorching heat. He provided for them in every way. Their entire life was focused on God and engaging with him. 
But Israel decided they would kind of got laid back. They kind of said, I think we'll just get, you know, this is a little too intense, this worship, the way Israel's worshiping. So they kind of pulled back like we do sometimes. We get apathetic and we get uh, insensitive and we kind of back off. And so the consequences were that there was great famine on the land, great drought on the land. So the story you heard in in chapter 17, Elijah hears from God and he's told to go now confront uh, Ahab. He'd been to the brook Cherith where God had fed him supernaturally with the ravens, you know, the food and the water. Then he'd been to Zarephath where the widow, uh, the, the widow fed him and he stayed with her for a long time. Now God told him, now you're going to go find King Ahab, confront him and tell him the battle is on. Okay, the challenge is on. So um, the first thing he does, he confronts Ahab idolatry. Then he confronts the people's double-mindedness and lack of attention to God. Then he calls on God to demonstrate his power, to reveal God to the people and bring them back to him. All right? So um, before he did this big thing, this big Mount Carmel, he'd been through three and a half years of some things he was doing to prepare him to make that big request of God. And so there's some things we can learn about the preparation or the, the, what we need to do before we make these big requests to God too. All right? The first thing he said, we see in 1 Kings 18.1, we see saw it in chapter 17. Every time God moved Elijah, it says, after a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. So the first thing we need to recognize is we need to cultivate a near to hear the Spirit of God. Do you know, you don't have to hear from the pastor. You don't have to hear from everybody else in culture. You'd be wise to listen to those peers around us that are teaching. But you know what? You can hear from the Lord. God has called each and every one of us to cultivate a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Predominantly, Scripture says that he spoke in times past by the prophets, then he spoke through Jesus Christ, then the word Jesus Christ became flesh and dwelled among us, and then this is the living word that predominantly directs us and leads us, but we can hear from God. And we can get the confirmation from God and what he's telling us to do. Now there's a series of kind of a process you go through for a confirmation of what you're to do, But he speaks to us individually. We need to cultivate a sensitivity to the Spirit of God, to hear the God, hear the God, hear the Lord, what he's telling us to do, a sensitivity. It sometimes will mean spending time with him. It could be messy. It could be dry times. Elijah was going through, you know, a little bit of food, not a lot of food. It was hardships. He went through lots of challenging times to prepare his heart to get his own soul out of the way so he could hear from the Father, hear the direction from the Father. Okay, it comes sometimes through spending time in prayer, but it's not always just perfect. It's up and down, it's dry times, it's warm times. It's like, oh Lord, where are you in this? Have you ever had one of those times? God, where are you in the middle of this? Anybody else? Have you, where are you, Lord? Yes. And when you, it's okay to say that, okay? But every stage of the process was more stripping of his will, more stripping of his self-reliance. I don't know about you, but I'd like to do things myself. I just like, okay, well, if I can do it, why would I bother asking God for it? Get up and do it. That's not the best approach. I found after many, many times of failing that my way is not the right way. Take, for example, the building you're sitting in. You know, we're sitting here and all of a sudden, uh, you know, we tried, we had eight different locations in the first year and a half. We knocked on every door. We tried to rewrite you know, zoning, we, all sorts of things we did. And all of a sudden, one day, God prompted one of his servants to call Pastor Rick. I think they need a building. God did it. God supernaturally did it. We kind of, I sat back and said, we can't do this, Lord. And God did it. God said, call, told that man to call us. And then I called our elders and the rest is history. So it takes time. And God is challenging us today to, you know, don't have to rush ahead with God. Ask him to give you his grace for patience so that you'll wait and <clears throat> not um, go ahead of God. But don't give up. He's molding you. He's preparing you under this pressure. He's preparing us. He's, he's doing something. Don't give up. Stay in the game. He says, in due season, you will reap if you faint not. Don't faint. God is going to bring you along. Jesus spent a lot of time with, his, uh, with the Lord alone. Scripture refers often about Jesus going away to pray, going away to pray. 
Learn to develop a sensitivity to the Spirit of God, an ear to hear what God is saying. All right? He's preparing us through uh, obedience and faithfulness, okay? They call it long obedience is faithfulness. And he said he will reward those people that are faithful, okay? Um, the second thing he said was speak truth boldly. We see in 1 Kings 18, 17, and 18, when he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commandments and have followed the Baals or the ways of the world. You know, we are called to speak God's truth boldly. And sometimes it is being an aggressive confrontation. We need to stand on a picket line and we just say, hey, this what you're doing is not right. Sometimes it's calling us to be an advocate for, uh, you know, unborn children, say. I know that good friends for years, for 18 years, they protested out over in Ontario. They had a, an abortion clinic and they'd spent 18 years protesting, silent protest every day. You know, abortion kills unborn children. And they stood there quietly every day, every day, every day. Your confrontation, your declaring the truth of God is not always a bold in your face. Okay? It is sometimes, and we're being called to speak up and be bold in certain times and certain situations. But a lot of time it is advocacy. A lot of times it was getting on a school board, getting on a city council, moving in. My kids were not in public school, but that didn't mean I didn't, I didn't care about public school. I volunteered in public school. I served in public school. I cared for those children. I cared for the programs. And it, I had opportunity to speak the truth of God's word in those places, and it was more influential there than me picketing out by the tennis court and the end to the school. Sometimes God is telling us to be assertive and very in your face. In other ways, he's saying be surreptitious and come in quietly and speak your truth to the influencers and watch what God will do in the middle. So he took a strong stance. He said, it's you and your abandonment of God's ways, which has caused this calamity to come on our people. All right. The disciples also they stood up and the day of Pentecost came and the early disciples, John and Peter, and they're working in the community and they're bringing this radical notion that Jesus is Messiah, that Messiah that Israel had been waiting for for all these years actually came in Jesus. And everybody's saying, you're a heretic, you're a heretic. And they said, no, Jesus is Messiah. So they were hauled up in front of the council and challenged. And this is what Acts 4.11 says. For Jesus is the one referred to in Scripture where it says, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of the councils were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in Scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. God desires to equip his people with a confidence to speak the word of God boldly in a strong way, in a, in a, a, a passive, uh, advocational way. But God is calling us to rise up that we need to be willing to speak the word of God boldly in our circumstances in our world today. It's the truth of God's word that sets people free. It's not a new program. It's not the, the latest whatever. It's the truth of God's word that will set people free. He said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you will be, truly be my disciple. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It is time for a bold declaration of the word of God in our relationships, in our workplace, in our public square. That we will live what we're living privately, publicly, so people would see it. Now, I've had people different times, I need you to stand up and you need to declare this, you need to do that. I'm waiting to hear for the, Lord, the word of the Lord. I've been quiet in many areas, but I've done work in other areas. When God tells me to move bold and strong and in your face, I will do that. And I pray you have that sensitivity to do the same thing with what God's telling you to do. But God is saying he's looking for a people that will bring his truth forward in confidence and boldness and in a timely manner and in a, in a respectful manner. Uh, God's uh, biblical way of confrontation, which is always gracious, always merciful, always offers a way out. You will bring that truth to people. And when we do, we see transformation. We see change. It's not macro at first. It's one at a time. Here a little, there a little. The word of God will change the heart, change the mind of people, and change the trajectory of our country and of our community. Amen? Is anybody with me? Amen. So 
we have to declare and speak the word of God boldly, boldly, boldly. Now, I know sometimes um, we, we don't always feel equipped. And my whole life, I've never felt overly equipped to know enough about a subject to speak intelligently for God in that situation. That happens lots of time. And therefore, if you're like me, you shrink back and you don't speak when you know you want to speak. And then you go home and go, why didn't I say something there? Well, there's things you can do. There's websites. There's people you can go to and learn how to declare the truth of God's word in a contemporary way. How to know what are the issues in a, uh, a social issue. What are the positions, the Christian worldview, and how to bring it to that community. I look at lots of different websites, but one I really recommend is, is Denison Forum. And this is a doctor. He's a you know, PhD. He's got a, a great research team. And they come out every daily with what's a contemporary issue in the world. And here's a biblical worldview. How we can respond to that intelligently, compassionately, lovingly. Where our goal is to help people come to God. Our goal is not to you know, exercise them or marginalize people that don't know God. Our goal is to love them, bring them close. So how do we do that in a respectful way? How do we speak the truth in love that will actually help people um, come to God, not just push them away from God because we're religious zealots, so they might say. All right? How do we do that? There's a way we can do it. Ask God to show you, to uh, bring you to websites, bring you to teachers, bring you to people that will help you articulate the truth well so that people can come to the knowledge of God. Declare and speak the truth of God boldly. Amen. We want to ask big things from God. You stand up big for him and he'll stand up big for you. That's what he said. Jesus said, you declare me before your people. I'll declare you before my father in heaven. There's, a, there's something God has promised for us. Speak up. It's time to let people know the goodness of God that we've found. The next thing is uh, he challenged um, the, the Jewish people, Elijah did, to um, follow God wholeheartedly. And uh, 1 Kings 18, 21, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. I tell you, I want to reiterate today, God is calling for a stepped up, a full stand decision. Whose side are you on today? Are you on the Lord's side or are you... Um, but the people said nothing. The people said nothing. Many of us struggle with the same questions of faith. We want to we want to address the situations we're seeing in our world by our own means. But God said, "I've got a way. If you will come to me, if you will walk with me, I'll help you lovingly declare the truth to God's to creation and all people." But He said, "You want to have, um, you want to hear from Him, and you want to have a wholehearted approach to God." As you do that, double mindedness is something we see here. That's what this is. Uh, James 1 5 to 8 talks about a double minded man is unsteady in all his ways. And we need to recognize that when we're double minded, we will miss the fullness of God's blessing for our life. Now, it's always good to come back to God. It's always good to come back to God. And it is normal to oscillate sometimes in faith, right? Sometimes you're believing for something, praying for something. It doesn't happen. It's like, maybe I missed it. I understand. There's no condemnation here. But to know what you know, what you know, and then continue to operate in your own flesh, in your own desire, in your own willingness to make this happen is not going to be successful for you. And the apathy I found in my life here shows up a little bit more apathetic in my children. When I fully embrace God and fully stand for God, what I found is my children rise up stronger and higher. That's, that's God's way. A wholehearted approach. As a matter of fact, that's the reason I decided to, to go wholehearted for God. Because I, I saw in Scripture what it said, my lack of wholeheartedness, would, how it would show up in my children, my grandchildren. It, I didn't go all hardcore for God because I was any man of God. I went hardcore for God because I knew it was going to have a direct effect on my children and my children's children and ultimately the community. Maybe you're here today and you, your life is happy. You're, you're saying, I'm living good enough for me. But maybe God's saying to some of you, you, it's time for you to get busy for the sake of your children and for the sake of your grandchildren. Maybe it's not about you. Maybe it's about those people coming behind you. Maybe God is saying, rise up, rise up, rise up. It's time for you to stop wavering and saying, let's go. We have a world that's having some challenges right now. Have you noticed? 
There's a world that needs somebody to stand up and confidently, lovingly declare, God is the answer. Jesus is the answer to every situation, to every relational problem, to every physical problem, to every social problem. The ways of God are the way that we can bring our nation back to fruitfulness and joy. I don't know about you. That's, that's a prayer worth praying. That's a prayer worth praying. There's no condemnation today, my friends. We were all in somewhere in that. And we'll all be maybe somewhere in that again. We just keep getting back up saying, God, your grace is sufficient for me. What was that term you used, Pastor Eric? Scandalous grace. It's a scandal that, that we would be as messed up as we are and God would allow his son to be sacrificed. It's scandalous grace. I love it. That's what's available to us today. What situation in your life needs scandalous grace? Is it a relationship? Is it a physical healing? Is it, is it a financial problem? There's people facing financial problems. It's real. It weighs you down. I understand completely. But I tell you, God's grace is sufficient for you today. If you choose to say, God, not my will, but your will be done, you begin to step in that by faith. His grace will pick you up and lift you and take you to the place he wants you to be. The place that you can no longer do it. Okay, Lord, I'm with you. Red Bull gives you wings. No, that's the wrong commercial. <laughs> Jesus gives you wings, all right? Somebody look at me, smile. It ain't about Red Bull. I'm looking at my friend Andrew back there. I tell you, Jesus wants to lift somebody out of something today. He wants to lift somebody out of disappointment. He wants to lift somebody out of a rut. You've been going in circles around and around and around and around. And God's saying, I want to lift you up. You've got a relationship that's failing. You've tried everything in your own mind. You, your wife says, I want to go to counseling. You say, no, no, we can do this ourselves. No, no, we can do this. I tell you, God's prophesying right now to somebody. God's saying, there's more for you. And God wants to bring you into it, but it may not be in the way that you think. And you've got to open your heart to a big God that pounds on that impossibility of you're a woman, you'll never fly, and says, okay, there's more. Pound on that thing and watch yourself move into what God's got for you. There's more for you. Say, there's more for me. There's more for my marriage. Come on. There's more for my community. There's more for my children. Come on, go with me on this. There's a win here. I tell you, God's doing something in this place. God is changing hearts. He's arresting people's attention. He's showing things where we've missed it and wants us to realign with him with a wholehearted surrender. You may be in here today and, uh, and you don't know the Lord. You've never experienced the grace of God, the love of God. He's saying, oh, I just want to let you know I love you so much. I want to pick you up and carry you and say my eyes are upon you. I want you to tell you that that big dumb mistake that you made over and over and over and think that it's not ever forgivable, I want you to know that I'm going to carry you through that right now. That's what the Lord is saying to people here today. I'm not worthy, somebody's saying. I'm not worthy. I've failed too many times. I've done too many wrong things. He's saying, my grace is sufficient for you. It's made perfect in your weakness. Would you let yourself be weak and receive the grace and mercy of Jesus today? He loves you so much. You maybe never experienced God. Uh, I'm going to give you a chance right now. We're going to give you a chance to pray and say, I want Jesus in my life. But first, will everyone just put your head down, give people a, a private moment so that they can make this commitment. We're going to ask you to put your hand up. If you've never trusted Christ for salvation, if you've never asked him to come into your life, um, just uh, put your hand up on the count of three. One, two, you're going to surrender all three. Put your hand up all over this place. Yeah, I see your hands. Yeah, you can put them down. Don't be shy. Is there anyone else? Jesus loves you. He's got something amazing for you. All right, let's pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. He died on that cross to make a way for me to come back to you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me in the way I should go. I trust Jesus now. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's, uh, let's put our hands together for those people that made that decision today. That's powerful. Way to go. I tell you, all of heaven's rejoicing right now. They're celebrating the decision you've made. And a supernatural work is happening in your heart. 
right now. Just trust God. Just lean into it. Say, okay, God, I'm going. But don't say, I'm going to go halfway. Say, I'm going to go. Surrender and yield wholeheartedly to Jesus. Amen. He loves you. Well, the story goes on. They finally get to Mount Carmel. And, uh, and uh, there is this confrontation. So there's the prophets of Baal and Ahab over here and Elijah and some other people here. And he said, what we're going to do is set up this contest. He said, I want you to build two altars or have two altars. He rebuilt the altars that was set up before and Ahab had knocked down. They cut the carcasses of the oxen in half. They put them on the altars. And then they called for the first time what, the, what Ahab's prophets called on Baal to light that fire. They said, don't put fire under it. Let's call on our God to light this fire. And that's what we're picking up the story here in verse 26. Then they called in the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves in swords and spears as was their custom until blood flowed. It's interesting when you worship the gods of this world and you get hung up in worldly ways, there's always a cost to you and there's a cost to humanity. You see certain world religions and people are called to sacrifice themselves uh, to, you know, for the name of their God. And, and, you know, when you're following the world's way, there'll always be a lot of physical sacrifice or be physical stuff. That's not God's way. God says, surrender and yield and have faith in me and watch what I will do. All right. Their frantic efforts show how people and we often strive in vain. You got to know today that your approach to God is just faith, faithfulness. You don't have to give money. You don't have to serve on a team. You don't have to do all these things. These things will help you experience him more and help advance his work, but we don't have to do anything. We just simply come in faith. Jesus, I'm here. I'm yours. I surrender. I tell you, the grace of God is amazing. We're scandalous. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord. He rebuilt it. We need to rebuild, church, our whatever practices we did, everything we did to uh, when we were experiencing and walking with God more wholeheartedly. Was there something that your parents taught you and you've just kind of said, oh, it's not for me now, but now you're knowing I actually, I actually need that. That will help me recover my relationship with God. They rebuilt the altars and we might need to build the, the activities of our life, rebuild them so we can re-engage with the Father who loves us. Elijah took 12 stones, one from each of the tribes descended from Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two bags of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. He repaired the altars and then he prayed this glorious prayer. He said, at the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up all the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. God did a miraculous sign for these people to recognize, and I believe God wants to do a miraculous sign in your life each and every day. And one of them might be a prayer you've not prayed in a long time or a prayer you've never prayed. Is there a prayer that you've never prayed? Is there a dream in your heart that you thought, well, man, women don't do that. 
Or is there a dream in your heart that said, oh, I need much more education and education is costly and I don't have any money for education. So therefore I've given up on my dream. Is there a prayer or something in your heart you want to do? I'm challenging you today to ask God what that is and to write it down, write in your Bible. I got Bibles, I got prayer books full of when we hired the next staff person at All Nations Church. I'm praying, you'll see in my page, praying for another staff person, praying for uh, associate pastor to come along, praying for a children's pastor who came first, praying for administrator, praying for all these things. Write it down. What do you think God wants you to pray for? What is it? Write it down. We're going to celebrate it together when you show it, when it happens. What is it? Is your prayer, your dream for this church or the church that you belong to? I encourage you to be part of something amazing, whatever it is, wherever it is. But what's your dream for this church? I tell you, I got a dream. It's a dream I've had all along. It's a dream I've had since I came to Christ. That God would allow me to touch the lives of people so that they would know Jesus and grow up in him so that they could share him with others. People that would have the confidence to lay their hands on the sick and see the healing and miraculous power flow in the lives of those people. You know, God's allowed me to put my hand on barren wombs, Kathy and I on barren wombs, people that no medicine can help, nothing can help. No, we've been seven years without a baby. We, what's going on? God has allowed us to lay hands on them and say, in the name of the G and Jesus, let this life flow. I pray and I believe for each and every one of us that we would know how to move and yield to the power of God in our world that desperately needs help. That we would be able to declare the hope of God in the most hopeless situations. We would declare that regardless of the, the bad past you've had, God can redeem your life and do something amazing through you. That's what I'm believing for every one of us. It's for us as people to experience Christ like we've never experienced him before. And you know what? Buildings and campuses and First Nations people will all happen as that dream becomes a reality. That's what I'm praying for, that we would grow up into him, we would walk fully according to what God has intended for us. What's your prayer for your personal life? What's your prayer for our church? Begin to ask God, write it down and say, God, I'll be faithful to it and let you do it. What's your next big prayer? Let's stand together as we get ready to worship. I'd love to just bless you. We can't look back, folks. We gotta look forward. <clears throat> just put your hands up as I pray for you today. Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I pray that you would uh, show us, give us wisdom how to carve out some time to spend with you so we could learn to hear your voice. Father, I pray that you would give us the confidence to declare your word boldly, be it quietly or be it loudly. Give us the confidence to declare your word Father, would you come and teach us how to rebuild those altars of connection with you and connection with others? Father God, would you help us um, prioritize those practices that would help us move with you? God, I pray that you would um, empower us to declare your word in such a way that you are glorified and people come back to you as a result. We ask this now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. And I countless reasons why I'll praise you anywhere, every time.